You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Today we are in Bologna. Where are we, Lionel? We are just next to the Basilica di San Luca in, uh, well, above Bologna, the finish line of stage one of the Giro d'Italia 2019. And it's underway, and uh, our first few riders are in a very odd, unusual situation uh, with Tom de Moulin going off first. What's, what's the latest, Daniel? Well, I think he went like a bit of a bag of spanners on the first half of the course. Anyway, everyone seems to be beating his intermediate time, so um, the time taken before the start of the climb. Uh, Nibel is beating it, Roglic has beaten it, and Superman has been it. And Superman is the leader in the clubhouse. Miguel Angel Lopez. I should introduce ourselves as well. I'm Richard Moore. That's Lionel Byrne. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello. And we're here in uh, Bologna. We're going to be uh, meandering down the, the hill to report as the stage unfolds. But it's so strange, really, to have the riders going off in the order that they are. Tom Demula, one of the big favourites, going off first. There's normally a huge build-up all day over several hours until the big favourites come at the end. But at the start here, we've got Demula, Lopez, Superman. Uh, Nibali, Bob Jungels, Primoz Roglic. You pronounce it for man like Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about the uh, the start order is it's directly reversed when compared to the profile of today's stage, isn't it? The first eight kilometres are flat, and then it's the two-kilometre climb, flanked by the stunning portico all the way up. The crowds are absolutely sensational on the hill. It's a perfect time trial course to open a Grand Tour with, and um, because of the anticipated change in the weather a bit later on, rain showers and perhaps uh, higher winds were anticipated later on, but the forecast has kind of changed. I'm not sure the rain's going to come in, but Simon Yates is the only major rider who is not going off in kind of the first wave. So it's going to be really interesting to see who the winners and losers are. Here comes Nibali, Rich, any second. We think he's, he's going to challenge Superman, certainly. Um, we've seen one Italian... There, there he goes. We've seen one Italian sporting national treasure already today. Alber Alberto Tomba, the skier, the slalom skier, was up here from Bologna. Nibali's just finished. What's his time? Well, we would tell you from the screen, but they seem to have lost the pictures and we're, we were watching a film about penguins a minute ago. Nibali's got the best time. Nibali, the best time. So already some surprises, but Roglic out on the course is going very quickly indeed. Daniel, how did Alberto Tomba describe the climb here? Like a black run. Where are we now, Lionel? We're in a bar in Bologna. The stage is over. The stage is over? Yeah. We've just watched Simon Yates, haven't we, on the big screen, third last man to go, as we made our way back down the hill, and we're, as you say, in a bar in Bologna. What happened today, then, on stage one of the Giro? Well, Primoz Roglic won pretty convincingly, didn't he, for Jumbo Visma? He did a madness, didn't he? It was an impressive performance. He was uh, a lot quicker than everybody else. Simon Yates, second fastest at 19 seconds. Vincenzo Nibali at 23. Miguel Angel Lopez. Superman. At 28 seconds. Tom de Moulin, also Except at 28 seconds. the reggae beat now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was the top five. Uh, probably not far away from what we would have thought would be the top five, save kind of the shuffling of the order. The disappointments or surprises perhaps were Bob Jungles only in 13th place, 46 seconds down on Roglic. Rafa Maika, impressive performance by him at sixth place at 33 seconds and better than Davide Formolo, who was 50 seconds down. So um, already a little bit of a shake-up uh, in the general classification. We, we kind of get a, a few hints as who is going to feature in this race. But of course, there's a, 
a lot of uh, racing to go before we really hit any a lot significant of Italy climbs. Left, isn't there there is a lot of Italy left. So day one done, and it all resumes again tomorrow. But the San Luca climb was really special, wasn't it? We were all up there at the top, and we spoke to a few riders as they crossed the line, one of whom was Britain's James Knox of De Koenig Quickstep riding his first Grand Tour. He was in 22nd place, a uh, pretty impressive result for him on his Grand Tour debut, and this is what he made of the climb. I think it's really difficult actually, because obviously I think the bulk of the, the benefit's going to be in going, you know, saving your energy to the end, but then it's, it's hard not to get a little bit carried away in the start of any time trial, so let alone one with a nasty 2k climb to finish. And there was tremendous crowds there as well, did that, did that affect you or were you able to sort of uh, uh, zone out from that? No, I really felt it on the climb, like you turn into a, a wall of people straight away. A lot of shouts in, a few going Jameses in amongst it, so that was nice. But uh, just trying really hard just to focus on my own effort. But yeah, the crowd does uh, give you something extra. Impressionante, says uh, Giulio Ciccone. Impressive, amazing. Sam, I mean, just tell me what was the atmosphere like on, in that incredible cycling stadium, cycling arena, the San Luca climb? Yeah, amazing, amazing, uh, amazing way to start uh, the Giro d'Italia. The Giro is still uh, so a long way to go. As long time, uh, felt fine today. That's the most important thing. And uh, Roglic is probably just outstanding. So that's what it is. Ma è un'atmosfera magica perché Domenico Pozzovivo says that he thinks he's done this climb San Luca more than anyone else ever in history, possibly in races. He's done the Giro delle Emilia many, many times, and he says that it was magical to do it in the Giro d'Italia. Speciale. For Primos, who is probably Maglia Rossa now, so uh, dream coming true for me and for the team. How strong is Primos at the moment? Because the gap he has over everyone else is big. It's incredible. He's so good. He's yeah, just from another level now and hope we can continue this until the end of the Giro. Three weeks is a long time to come in and this strong. Is that a concern or is just a good position to be in? Yeah, we had a good plan and I think he's in the, fo in the good shape now. and We can do this until the end. And lastly, what did you make of the climb and uh, did you have a chance to sample the atmosphere on your way up? Yeah, I just go full gas. It was super nice. I feel like a good uh, atmosphere here and uh, yeah, so happy to be in Italy. The last voice you heard there was Lawrence de Plus of Jumbo Visma. He's going to be a very important teammate for Primoz Roglic, you would imagine. A very good performance as well by him today. Yeah, it was. He was eighth in the end. 35 seconds down, in the same time as Teo Gagan Hart of Team Ineos. should mention him as well. Because Another noteworthy performance, definitely. Indeed. Yep. But when de Plus came through the finish line and came to a stop, I approached him and said, can I ask a question or two? And he said, yes, fine, but can you tell me where I am, what my result was? And I was, oh, I don't really know. So I had to look it up on my oh, phone. Oh, oh, I to valuable, <laughs> valuable data. <laughs> yeah, using my I'm data. Oh, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, I managed to get onto Pro Cycling Stats pretty quickly and <laughs> tell him where he what was and how, and how he was doing, <laughs> how he'd done. The scene. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked him, yeah, I, I wanted to ask him well now you know your result are you pleased with that but before I could open my mouth and ask the question our friend Renard from Belgian TV nipped in and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and spent the next five minutes talking to De Plus but then uh, he was good enough to answer a few questions and I think although did he not actually initially make to go away well, I and you, you said yeah, hang was, on a second yeah, he I looked <laughs> up your result for you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah he was going to roll down the hill and, and go off and I was like how oh, oh, can I hang on a second that, that was three data. megabytes of data <laughs> <laughs> all right all right anyway <laughs> but they will be presumably absolutely delighted by that today Napalm we also heard in that montage from um, Julio uh, Ciccone, who is in the blue jersey for the best climate tonight, his time on the San Luca climb, six minutes, two seconds. I think that's a record for San Luca. There have been a lot of pictures going around. People have been sharing the famous photo of uh, Fiorenzo Magni from the Giro um, time trial in which year was it? 1956. 2.4 kilometer time trial up the San Luca climb. His time then, so slightly longer because today the climb is 2.1 kilometers. But Manu's climb, uh, Manu's time, eight minutes and 23 seconds. So two minutes and 21 seconds slower than Chicone for a slightly longer course. Not a real surprise considering 50 years <laughs> have elapsed really. and technology <laughs> has improved <laughs> quite a bit. I and is, uh, I don't think that clear evidence <laughs> of foul play. <laughs> we, we, we didn't we didn't see many 
Uh, bike changes, did we? Um, most of them just stayed on the on the time trial bikes, and it was you know quite kind of interesting how many of the riders went up quite steep sections of the climb on the on the tri bars. Simon Yates out the saddle almost all the way up, uh, and you know he he wasn't that quick on the on the flat section, but really fast on the on the climb itself. Ne Napalm, you've got the results in front of you. One thing that occurred to me. Um, since we are in the city, known as La Grassa, the fat one, it struck me that lighter riders did well today. And one, one common theme among the, the guys who may be disappointed slightly, the, the good time trialists who didn't have such a good performance today, the young horses, the Dumoulins, they're much bigger guys. And uh, you know, we all saw today how steep that climb is. Um, so I don't know. Was that? I mean, if you look look down the top ten, top fifteen, a lot of l light guys in there, aren't there? Yeah, that's a good point actually. And I think that the the conundrum about whether to swap bikes, I don't think it really was much of a conundrum in the end. When you see that uh, of all the riders that were in the top positions, they just rode the the one bike um, on the whole course. What was really was quite interesting was how long they stayed in time trial position or, or or at least stayed in the saddle it was a mountain goat type of climb but they didn't really attack it in a kind of mountain goat sort of way i, I thought that was quite interesting um also the speed on the flat was absolutely incredible i mean touching 70 kilometers an hour average on that section but of course the most interesting thing about the way the day panned out was that all of the top riders bar simon yates went in the first wave of riders the first 25 or so riders and the reason for that was because of the weather forecast was anticipating a bit of rain in the late afternoon early evening and presumably they all of the teams thought well we'll put our best guys off early so they get the best conditions it will be really interesting to find out uh, tomorrow from Matt White you know what the thinking was behind Simon Yates going off so late and in the end it didn't make any difference because no rain fell and the, in, if anything probably the wind dropped a little bit in um, in the afternoon which may account for his slightly slower time on the flat. Also the issue of the hot seat and uh, Roglic was mm. stuck up at the top waiting sitting I think with his girlfriend or, or partner anyway in the in the sun for two or three hours you know you do wonder how much teams take that into consideration. You mean winning is perhaps an you know, you wouldn't want to be up there all afternoon, sat there, because it's not just about the hot seat, is it? They'd have to stay up there for the press conference and for the podium presentation and all the rest of it. So you're right, he was up there for, what, three hours and something, waiting. Is that a reason to not to go off first when you think it's going to rain later? Nobody's going to tank, are they, and say, well, I'll try and finish second. You know, I mean, Roglic has got 19 seconds in the bank no, on Yates. As it turned out, presumably he would have had the same ride if he'd gone off last today. True. The fastest clothing in the World Tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Run. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our headline sponsor, without whose support we wouldn't be here covering the Giro d'Italia from start to finish. This is the first of our nightly episodes from the Giro. Big thanks to Rafa. They will be following, of course, EF Education First throughout the Giro and producing EF Gone Racing films. Have a look at them at rafa.cc. Subscribe to Rafa Films on YouTube and we uh, say a big thanks to Rafa. Moving on, chaps, looking at the results. You I mean, you said, Lionel, that... The, the identity of the top sort of four or five riders wasn't a huge surprise, but I would say Nibali was a surprise. Second for a lot of the day, third in the end, and I think that was a surprise. When we look at Nibali, he's obviously a former winner, but he's a guy who often comes to the boil late in the race, doesn't he? And he's obviously started this Giro in really great shape. Not a, not a specialist time trialist either. No, I mean, a guy who knows the San Luca climb certainly very well. He's, he's pretty light, um, he is in good form, it's well documented. So I don't think that was that much of a surprise. The big negative surprise for me was Dumoulin, particularly because I think he thought he'd done a pretty good ride and he was quite surprised um, by how quickly he was overtaken by how many people he was overtaken. Um, he, ha he hasn't done too many time trials this year. I think he's done one individual time trial and a couple of team time trials, but there's no problem. I mean, I was told today, I was asking a few people, he's been working on his new well, with his new time trial bike, the Cervelo, since last September, way before they 
came on board as official sponsors. And as regards this, um, well, th this comment that he made, which has now been the subject of a lot of s scrutiny that he wasn't going as well as last year, um, certainly the feeling at Sunweb is that that was uh, taken very much out of context. He was asked about a specific day in a specific race, and he said, well, basically, I didn't go as well as I did last year. So I think that point was with regard to liege baston liege more than anything else. Um, and I think he thinks he's going, he's going pretty well. But I think there's also... Uh, a sort of one that certainly will be after today. There's a, a widespread acknowledgement and acceptance that Roglic is just off the charts at the moment. <laughs> Richard said on the way down, um, as we walk back through the stunning portico, through the crowds, uh, watching the, the, the second half of the race come up and kind of slightly discombobulated by this upside down uh, running order that we had. Because normally. Say upside down ski jump. Then. No, no. <laughs> a lot of. Uh, beep, beep, a ski lo jumper a lot of reference. A lot of Roglic fans, though. I mean, a lot of fans with. He's got this kind of logo with a set of wings, like Angel's Wings almost, um, Roglic. And there's quite an, a, a Roglic fan club up there today, Slovenians and, and other people, um, supporting him. And you do feel like he's got a lot of momentum behind him. He's got a very strong team. Lawrence de Plouze is going to be really important, I think. The other big surprise, though, was Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I Superman mean, and the Whalers. He, he, <laughs> that, was, that was probably the best time trial of his career, no? Yeah, it was, on a very atypical course. Mm -hmm. um, but he went very quickly on the... On the he, he did, he was, but the He gaps, was quicker than de Moula on, on the flat. He was. The, the gaps between the riders on the flat were tiny, though, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, it was, just, it was, the, same, it was on the same second, admittedly. But you still wouldn't have imagined that before today. No. But Roglic has got momentum, hasn't he? Um, has, from the start of the year, won the UAE Tour, won Tirreno Adriatico, won the Tour of Romandy, three week-long stage races. I remember famously, um, Daniel, last year when Simon Yates was, you know, pinching all those seconds in the Giro and, and cementing, a, a building a lead in the um, pink jersey, that, you know, in quite a methodical way, just as and when, nibbling away when, when he could. And you kind of dismissed of 10 days work as well he's just won a Tirreno Adriatico and and at the time I was completely dismissive of that comment because I thought it was unfair but actually that's a very that was a very good point and probably was right the the, the thing here is we know Roglic can go over three weeks he's done it in the Tour de France you know top uh, five position fourth it, last year fourth, yeah in in the Tour de France so his staying power is probably not in question, but there is a difference still between sort of being fourth and being first. And it's, it is something we will always say, but is there the danger of being too hot too soon when the final week is where this race will be decided? It's OK, great to take 19 seconds in the first eight kilometres, but there's now a real kind of almost a dead patch as far as the GC riders are concerned until next Sunday's time trial in San Marino, where, of course, he could make some more gains, uh, potentially, because that's another time trial with this kind of, you know, backloaded climbing at the end. The, the other thing with Roglic is that I think he's naturally quite an aggressive rider and he doesn't like sitting in the peloton and, and letting his team control things, and even when he is the strongest rider. And I think... On, on terrain like you find at the Giro, which invites attacks, um, you know, he might be enticed into doing too much, maybe in the same way that Simon Yates was last year. Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, at the back of the pack, please. That's Seb Piquet, race radio at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode of our Giro coverage is sponsored by The Week. Now, the week, Rich, it, it saves you time, it filters the news, and it's given me a range of views and opinions and coverage of stories that I probably wouldn't see if I just stuck to my usual reading routine because it pulls stories from across the spectrum. It gives you a fuller picture, and the thing that I really like about it is that everything is really bite-sized, so you can absorb quite a lot of information in uh, one sitting. You were flicking through the week on our flight over to Bologna, what uh, caught your eye, Rich? I was. I was reading it very closely. A story about Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man, uh, the man behind Amazon, of course, who wants to colonise the moon. He made a, an announcement <laughs> recently in Washington. Um, it was, said the New York Times, a carefully choreographed 
event akin to the announcement of a new iPhone. The Daily Telegraph spoke of his desire to colonise space and The Guardian said that the tech billionaire's space race is really heating up. Um, he wants to go to the moon, he wants to take people to the moon. Um, he, he forecast that the solar system could eventually support a population of a trillion humans. Then we'd have a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins, he says. Probably a thousand Eddie Merckxes as well. Wow, yeah, when, when does a tour of the moon start? Exactly. <laughs> Well, we'll be there um, if we're if we're fortunate enough. The week it doesn't just cover billionaires, gazillionaires. It covers everything from science, sport, food, the arts, and news and politics. Of course, it's kind of the anti echo chamber. And if you want to join thousands of people who trust the week as their essential curated news source, try it yourself for free. You can get six issues for free if you go to theweek.co.uk/slash offer and use the code cycling. That's theweek.co.uk/slash offer and then enter the code cycling. Giro d'Italia. Hi, Giro d'Italia. What it means for you? You are English. Scottish. Are you Scottish? Oh, very, important <laughs> very important distinction. <laughs> the Bologna is uh, one of the greatest uh, city. She get all, all people, all the time. It's a bike to the university, but the university is nothing. It's the people they live in. Well, that wasn't Marlon Brando. <laughs> Daniel, who was that? Well, it was our host last night, wasn't it? The restaurateur, the, I think the owner of La Drogueria de la Rosa. Very appropriate of the, the well, the chemist of the, of the, of the rose or of the pink. Um, probably actually slightly inappropriate vis-a-vis the Giro d'Italia and, and Giro d'Italia. You said earlier the uh, Bologna is known as the, the fat one, also the, the red one and the learned one. It's got these three names, isn't it, for its history of its university and its politics. Very much so, very much so, Rich. Um, the, we will obviously be focusing on the food because we're neither learned, well, red, well, maybe. <laughs> um, we, we ate very well, didn't we, Napalm? We had a couple, we we've already had a few specialities. I was stunned to arrive in Bologna and, and you revealed that the mayor of Bologna is trying to outlaw I've been having correspondence Bolognese. with him. Have you been yeah, in touch with him? I've been him having here? correspondence with him. I think I might speak to him tomorrow about his campaign to rid the world of spaghetti a la bolognese. Spag-ball. It's a long, old story. This I don't think you want me to go into it. There's a big battle going on between Bologna and Napoli. Napoli says that it should be spaghetti a la bolognese. Uh, in Bologna, they say spaghetti have never existed. In Bologna, it's, it, they're vermicelli, uh, which are little worms, it's but they would never have them with ragu, uh, with bolognese sauce anyway. Is this... Uh going to appear in episode one of Kilometre Zero on Monday? I think it will be mentioned. Excellent. Excellent. Kilometre Zero. Well, nice mention, Lionel. Kilometre Zero is sponsored by Hans Grohe. Thank you very much to Hans Grohe. Uh, Nine episodes of Kilometre Zero coming during the Giro Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And episode one, Daniel, is going to be on... It's going to be called La Grasa, the fat one. Excellent. But on, it's not about you. It's not about you, <laughs> Napalm. <laughs> oh, very hard. Oh, well, he pointed. He pointed. Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> that I didn't. Was, that was some pointing. No, uh, I didn't it's point. Fem- it can't be you. It can't be you anyway. Because it's, <laughs> it's feminine. <laughs> anyway, uh, on the bolognese, is the objection to the sauce being called bolognese or to the fact that it shouldn't be served with spaghetti? On both counts, really. Um, certainly should never be eaten with spaghetti and the, the actual bolognese sauce the real one has tuna in it believe it or not oh this is ridiculous, um, this is ridiculous. The, the first one ever ever sort of made never called that in bologna um, had tuna in it well yeah. we'll get to the bottom and of this. was and rich is going to hate this but there was recently some kind of remember last year we had the tiramisu world cup recently there was a uh, bolognese um, or ragu alla bolognese world cup Napoli versus Bologna and Napoli won. Wow. I, I, why am I going to hate that? I like the sound of that. I mean, it's proper food. You Spank were very ball. ambivalent last year about... Tiramisu well, is, uh, you know... Kind of doesn't, yeah, tippy-tappy. Like, yeah. Anyway, I've had, uh, I've had ragu for every meal so far and I'm going to continue that tonight. But we need to finish the podcast before we can go for dinner. Beef, good, good link, good segue. There's been a bit of beef about Simon Yates' comments... Um, in the press conference yesterday. Well, you were there, it's Daniel, and Simon Yates was pretty bullish, wasn't he? 
in- incredibly bullish, Rich, um, on, well, there were two questions on which he was particularly bullish. And um, one, he was asked, who's the favorite for the uh, Giro d'Italia? And he said, me. And um, with a... With a no, there's no problem with that. We, there should no. be more of that. Yeah, right? there should, I mean, but it was if the... If you're an elite sports person and you're trying to win an event, then what's wrong with saying, I think I'm the favourite? I think it's to be applauded, but... It, it was the, w- the withering sort of manner in which it was delivered, I think, which was well, quite it, impressive. He, he's the only one who has to live up to that. So he, he's, he's also the, with that, the, the only one in, in, in the field who won the last Grand Tour on the calendar. Correct. So. And, and the other thing that came out of the press conference has been talked about a lot today is this comment about he made in a in an interview with Ruler magazine that the, his rivals should be shitting themselves um, this is getting all a bit scatological for me um, well, and, Tom and the Moulin he, may very well be well yeah, there you go the and I mean, he stood by that history repeats itself he stood by well <laughs> it's funny you should mention that line because I understand that this that Yates's press conference and some of the comments he made in the press conference have been the subject of some mirth in the Sunweb camp today um, amongst the riders. So um, I don't know whether his intention was to sort of fire up his rivals, but I think he might have done that. But you're absolutely right, Lionel. I relish that, you yeah. know, and I think we saw that kind of beef a couple of years ago when De Moulin was leading the race and had a lot of beef with Nibali and... Quintana. Quintana, yeah, and and it was great. It was yeah. refreshing. It was good. It was uh, and it's typical and, of the and, Giro, and, and yeah, typical of the Giro, and, and but un- unfortunately not typical in the social media age where things get blown up. And I suspect that Simon Yates is going to be immune to that sort of worry. I don't think he cares. I mean, he's not even on MySpace, is he? <laughs> I don't think he. You spoke to him though, briefly. Shall we hear I did. from him? Uh, let's talk to him. Well, let's hear from him briefly. If you just look at the profile of this Giro, I mean, it really sort of stands out how straightforward it looks in the first 10 days. Has your preparation taken that into account? I mean, are you coming in undercooked? I wouldn't say undercooked, but a lot of my training has gone really specifically for the end of the race. There are going to be some really big days back to back. And just the build up has been more about that. I think the race will lend itself, like I said before, to being conservative anyway. I think some of these stages in the early part are actually trickier than everyone, you know, everyone saying, oh, it's going to be just 10 flat days, super easy, but actually some of them are quite tricky. Uh, so we'll be careful. Tricky because the, obviously there's a risk of crashes, or also because there might be climbs that people haven't really paid any attention to? Both. Just, you know, smaller roads, also uh, really quite technical roads. Uh, just things like that, you know, maybe a bit of wind here and there you don't really know eh? how much do you study the route i mean how in how much detail do you know those stages in first person n- not at all only the the time trials really but the rest of the stages i look just online and in more and more details we get closer to the race when do you do that like tonight do you look do you spend like an hour looking at the prologue course or on online or well the prologue course was uh, a bit easier because i did uh, gp emilia a couple of times yeah. i never finished unfortunately because it's, it's too late in the season so you got that climb five times in that exactly, so you did exactly i've probably done it already 10 times or whatever yeah. so um as much as I need to, really. You know, we also have Google Maps, Velo Viewer, and, and all this sort of stuff to, to really look at. So um, I go for it pretty pretty well. The Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport for supporting the Cycling Podcast. It's an anniversary, chaps. Three years ago... Science and Sport came on board with us and supported us at the Giro d'Italia initially, um, Kilometer Zero and the regular podcast. We wouldn't have been at that Giro, but no, for they Science were and Sport. very, very important yeah. early sort of partner for us. And subsequently, we uh, we hooked up with Science and Sport on a on a long term relationship, and we're very, very grateful to them for their support. You can get twenty five percent off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25, that's SISCP25. Um, but yeah, thank you to Science Support. We raise a glass to Science and Support tonight and throughout the Giro, why not? Mm. We heard from Simon Yates just before the, the break there. You were gonna say something, Lionel? I was gonna just sing the praises of the course and the atmosphere and the way today, um, uh, well, sing the praises for everything except the way that it kind of played out over the afternoon it was it was slightly unfortunate that it was front loaded i was initially very excited because it was like wow we're straight into it there's no slow burn no build no wait for the big riders to come the problem was that within sort of 25 minutes it was kind of 
done, really. Yeah. Then just waiting for Simon Yates. And thank goodness, really, that Mitchelton Scott didn't choose to put Simon Yates off early because that would have really um, flattened the day. And it was noticeable that a lot of people were filtering back down the hill while riders were still coming up. Um, and, you know, it was a very different atmosphere by the looks of it in the shadows at sort of eight o'clock compared to the sunshine of uh, five o'clock and the kind of the festivities and the party atmosphere on the climb. But everything else about it was the, the, the kind of perfect recipe for the opening of a grand tour. I can't remember. It was, a, bit, it was, a, day that, it was a day that peaked a little bit too early, wasn't it? It was like Simon Yates at the Giro last year. Yeah, um, it just went. It just went off a bit, a bit too quickly. Um, but the setting was spectacular. The atmosphere up there was brilliant. The noise getting caught in the portico oh, it was and wonderful. Yeah, echoing up the hill. The the way that the the. the, the the road went where we stood on that Z bend, the really, really steep part. Well, speculating about how steep that was, but Daniel, you said it must be 20 plus percent yep. that corner. Uh, you know, reminiscent of the Mur de Huy from um, Flesh Wallone in, in the sense of how difficult it was. And, and double um, the length. And double the length, exactly. Yeah, a well, real test. You, we heard earlier on from uh, Lawrence de Plus, who's set to have an important role. I had a chat at the top with Chris Yule Jensen who was part of that Giro team last year with Simon Yates and he's got a very important job as well um, this year uh, let's hear what he had to say how was that I mean one of the more difficult time trials I guess uh, yes and no difficult uh, the last 3k or 2k definitely but uh, one of the more beautiful uh, prologues and time trials I've done in a while fantastic scenery um, the fans have come out early um, in support of all us riders and it makes it all more enjoyable to get a Grand Tour kicked off I think for, the, for a lot of us riders, then it's a question of uh, blowing out the cobwebs and making sure that you sort of uh, brush off all the dust that's been uh, landing on the legs last couple of days because it's always a bit of a tricky period. You train and prepare for a Grand Tour and then you spend the week leading up to it trying to recover as much as possible and then you're always a little bit uh, on edge uh, in terms of how you react to being so fresh and that's where a prologue like this is just perfect because uh, you look after yourself, you do your own thing and then... Uh, you have two two k of solid climbing to make sure you you empty yourself well and truly. Had had word of uh, Roglic's time filtered back to the Michelin Scott camp before before your ride. It wasn't a split time that was being referred to in my radio. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the only thing uh, Whitey made sure to remind me of was to not to uh, to make sure I stay on uh, both tires and uh, just to get through in one piece and um, not overdo it and. Uh, uh, just to make sure I'm uh, I'm feeling good by myself afterwards. So and, yeah. And Simon is obviously a very very confident. Um, I think he said in his press conference yesterday just how confident he is. How does that make you guys feel? Uh, I think it's a. Uh, it is fantastic to uh, be around such a a young but an experienced uh, rider character such as Simon. Um, he really is uh, capable of uh, just taking everything in his stride. Really, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect him. And uh, he he's always uh, able to uh, maintain a level head, uh, certainly with his, especially with his teammates and his colleagues, staff and everyone else included. And um, yeah, it just it filters through the team. Uh, myself, my, my my teammates, the staff, the mechanics, the sports directors, the Swannies. You know, it's just uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty cool. And I think uh, it's obvious for people who follow him in the press that he's a cool customer. But uh, he's sympathetic. He's serious. He's he's, he's a laugh. But uh, he also has uh, seven teammates who are going to put put it all on the line for him. Well, I mean, you were part of the Giro team last year. He's talked about unfinished business. Do you do you sort of feel that as well coming back? Yeah, but I mean, the last person to have won a Grand Tour was Simon. <laughs> so uh, we were watching the highlights uh, in the bus before the start, where uh, yours were went through obviously uh, the Giro and everything that that included five stage wins and uh, and a slightly on, on leaving on a, on a bit of an unfortunate note GC wise. Thankfully, then. Uh, the resume of 2018 finished with Simon on the podium in Madrid, so there's absolutely no reason to uh, to us to be uh, confident in his abilities. And yeah, just got to take it one day at a time. Really, it could be pissing rain 200 kil- kilometers tomorrow, so we've got a handful already. Now it's just a question of getting back and uh, trying to recover. So that was Chris Yule Jensen, the the Irish Dane um, who uh, rides for Michelin Scott, and uh, yeah, he's uh, he's become a very important man for them in what is a very strong team. Uh, Mikel Nievi, Brent Bookwalter, um, it's a really, really uh, well-equipped team to support Simon Yates. We should wrap things up for our first day at the Giro. Who's going to win tomorrow? We're going to the we're going to Fucecchio, the home of Andrea Taffy. 
He's not going to win. I'm, I'm going to wear my Andrea Taffy visor for oh, the podcast yeah. tomorrow because I, I've been running in it the last two it's days. It's like a this golf is, thing, isn't it? Well, this is a, a Mape quick step casket with the top cut off and um, yeah, restart it into a visor. I couldn't do that. I'd end up with just a, a big pink circle on the top <laughs> of my head. <laughs> So you're gonna you're gonna wear that for the I'm podcast. I'm gonna wear it for tomorrow. the podcast. Great. We're going into Tuscany tomorrow. Well, who is gonna win? I mean, it's a sprint stage tomorrow, no? Or um, is it? Uh, yeah, might, oh, you might think a break so. stage. I mean, everyone's fresh, because aren't they? Very very quickly. This is now Jumbo Visma's dilemma, isn't it? They they have the pink jersey, but I would suspect they would not want to defend it in the conventional sense of putting people on the front chasing they're, things down. No, but they're gonna yeah they're gonna they have struggle no to lose to. it as they well, aren't they? Yeah. They will, because the sprinters will be too, so far back that you know, time bonuses might take them a few days to catch up. But you know, having the jersey and defending the jersey are two very different things. So I anticipate them just, just sailing a- through and, saying, don't have it, yeah. and being fairly open with certainly De Kerning quick step and saying, look, we're not going to ride. I could be proved wrong, no, but the onus will be on De Kerning tomorrow, yeah. I'd have thought. Yeah, Elia, Elia Viviani. Viviani. Surely the favourite. Gaviria as well. Anyway, we'll uh, join you again tomorrow night. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank well, you, Richard. What are we going to eat? What are we going to eat tonight? Uh, well, it's obvious. I mean, spag, Lionel's spag already bol. said. Spag bol. Bologna. Do you know Bologna? That, that comes from Bologna. Yeah. The, the, a, the term. It's a and Bologna is really mortadella, which is the famous yeah, sort of strange, sausage isn't it? meat from soft, Bologna. Soft, m- sliced meat. Oh, oh, we're going to be lucky to get, to get a meal at okay, this, right, at this time. Time's marching on, isn't it? Yeah. Vamos. Let's go. Okay, thanks, Daniel. No me de guru no, no.